mean, as girls, we're feisty. If we can do that, it will not in the world. But sweet, my M. Not. My name is Anthony. I am at the moment a 62 year old uh, cabaret burlesque performer. I call myself the newest, oldest showgirl in town because I don't see other people doing this at uh, my age, but I like the idea that people know I'm an old showgirl. Turning 60 for me was this is an opportunity to actually start doing things that I kind of think I missed out on when I was a bit younger, to feel expressive as a gay man was always a bit sort of frowned upon. You could mask and try to pass as a straight person, and I never did. I was a puffy boy, and then I kind of tried not to show myself up too much. And then I thought, if I'm now at this point at 60, and I haven't actually played about in some of the playgrounds that I want to play in, it's my own fault for having left it so late. So I love sewing. I love makeup, I love seeing people with great hair, and I love the kind of creating the characters that burlesque and drag has enabled me to do. And 60 just seemed to be a kind of fuck it moment. <laughs> so I've created a character called Medusa Has Been. She's a kind of alter ego that gives me permission to make her Look, in my mind, I'm the most beautiful thing in the room. So I basically, in Medusa, walk through the room like I am the most beautiful thing. I don't say that about myself. I could never say that about myself. I don't believe that it's true about myself, but I really believe it about Medusa. She's given me the ability to be so fucking gorgeous and then go, it's a wig. And... Yeah, what does that make her? A cipher, a clown, an alter ego, uh, permission. <laughs> permission to be rudely self-centered <laughs> just for a split second or two. She gives me permission for five minutes on stage to express. doing eyeliner it's the worst so I've got hooded eyes so it'll just like print the house of the law is my burlesque collective that I created um, and it's made up of currently um, it ranges between sort of five to seven people and that sort of changes over time but we have resident performers and essentially we put on cabaret and burlesque shows and it involves drag, singing, comedy, all this kind of stuff. We basically try and forge creatively and elevate the art form. We get lots of different people in but yeah essentially we put on burlesque and cabaret shows and try and define what burlesque means to us and push things creatively and build more of a community in Vermont and that's kind of our ethos really. With House of the Law, we do a lot in queer spaces. That's really important to me, and particularly in the heart of the Birmingham queer community. I want us to ha always have a show there where possible because um, not only will we be bringing a diverse cast and a diverse art form, it's just important to take up space in that. However, I think if you're doing something in a queer space with queer performers all of the time, it can become a bit of an echo chamber, which that has its value. So I'm very much passionate about going into the mainstream as well. What's it like to bring a queer show to a straight crowd, for example? And that's where they're exposed to a world perhaps they're not used to or they're curious by or they might have experienced in some capacity themselves or have always been intrigued by it. And we're saying, this is us, and we're showing you what we can do, and we are powerful, we're intelligent, we're sexy, we're welcoming, all of these kind of things. And that's where the change happens. Specifically, I knew I wanted to make an impact. I think that was my biggest goal, personally. I wanted to make an impact on the scene. I wanted to prove what we did was valid, it was powerful, it was political. Um, it was aggressive art, but also entertaining and sexy, all, all, all of these kind of raw, good sort of feelings. Um, so my intention for it was very, very clear. I've got a fan again, I'm so sorry. Oh, mate, I have to do it. 
chimneys. <laughs> Don't stand on me fan, whatever you do. Because <laughs> I was watching these policeman's shoes. And <laughs> started burlesque uh, four years ago. Uh, it was one of my friends that said to me, do you want to do a... Well, she asked me if I wanted to do poi. I said, you'll set fire to my weave. There'll be no poi. And then she said to me, do you want to try pole dancing? I said, I'm top heavy. That's not going to happen either. So a few weeks later, she came back to me and said, Dee, I've found the perfect thing for you. And I said, what, what? Burlesque. The first class I went to, we were all speaking, just speaking about the, the history of burlesque. Well, I want to get up and dance and I want to do this and that. So I thought to myself, is this all it's about? Oh, I'm not paying for this. So the following week, that's when we started with the strip and the, what strip means, what it stands for, and the S is for suggest. So that's what you do on stage. You've got the strip in your head. Suggest, tease, reveal, and pose. And that's, but there's no I. It's like, it's like a strip, but with no I. I worked at a care home for people with dementia, a private care home, and there's a residential bottom floor, dementia on the top floor. During the pandemic, I think it, it, it hit everybody. We didn't know. It was a very uncertain time for a lot of us. You'd be worried about, am I going to get COVID from a resident? And we had to wear the masks and so I'd do a 12 hour shift. But then as, a, as an end of life champion, you'd work that bit extra to make sure that those that were going to pass away wasn't, wouldn't die on their own because you couldn't have families in the care home. There was nobody that could sit with them because you can't leave someone who's about to die and just go home off shift. You, you can't switch off. And I found I couldn't switch off, so I wasn't sleeping very well. And, but then I'd be up again to do another 12-hour shift. And so burlesque, when I knew I had a show or got a booking, of, that was my outlet to just forget everything, music in my ears and just prance around. this song. <laughs> I love it. I absolutely love it. The first thing I wanted to do with my burlesque was to say, I'm 60 and I'm not going anywhere. But if you kind of grab it and say, I want to make the best of my 60s and reinvent myself, then that was the, the kind of the act that I put together. What I didn't realize is that it appealed to 20 year olds and 30 year olds and 40 year olds. And on the first performance that I did, I had older people coming up and saying, we're so proud of you, I'm 57 or I'm 63. And then I had 20 year olds going, oh my God, this is amazing. My parents should watch your act because they're aging too quickly. And I realized that my kind of 60 message was just a kind of symbol for, you know, be yourself at any age, don't wait until you're 60. It kind of felt like I got rewarded by trying to say one kind of, um, can I swear? I kind of wanted to say one fuck you moment. And in fact, I got rewarded with like loads of love. And it's like, this is not a fuck you moment. This is a fuck yes moment. Lady Blue Phoenix is a very much more confident part of me. In a way, it's me being able to, I guess, exaggerate parts of my personality that I don't do in everyday life.
I've done dance all my life. Um, did ballet, I've done gymnastics, did some karate and stuff, did some hip hop and things. But growing up, there weren't that many opportunities for me to dance. Coming from America, you kind of end up falling into some camps of either you're part of the popular kids camp, so you can do the cheerleading, all that kind of stuff. I wasn't popular. Um, <laughs> and then you fall into the other camp of not popular, but it's the click, so all the POCs click, the golf click and all that. And again, it's like, I didn't really fit in. When I hit puberty, obviously I couldn't do ballet because I grew breast. <laughs> <laughs> being honest, and you're like, oh, she's too busty. No, 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 gymnastics is the same thing in karate. So it got to the point where it was like, everything I want to do has been taken away from me. So I will just dance at home in my room and do it that way. <laughs> my burlesque journey started when I was taking a show by my husband in 2012 in Southend on Sea, where we went and saw a group of ladies perform burlesque. And it was an amazing show. It was. You know, it was quite inspiring to see all these women up there on stage. I can't say I connected with anyone because, again, all female, all Caucasian. They all, it's not like they had similar looks, but they all were under the size that I was. And I sat in there and I was thinking, I was like, you know, this is not I'd like to do, but there's no one on stage who looks like me. It's not just the majority of white Caucasian people who go to shows. There's, again, minorities who walk in, LGBT, POC, by POC people. And so for me, it was more or less, I wanted to be that person that's someone in the audience to look up and be like, she's plus size, she's black, she's queer, she's, she's not even she, she's a they, them. Um, <laughs> they're inspiring and such, and that's what I aim to be. This is an art form that has evolved so much from its original historical roots that anyone who says or tells anyone, oh, that can't be burlesque, they need to realize that evolution is a thing and either you evolve or you become extinct. <laughs> it was about 2001 and I saw this performance advertised in Nottingham and it was in a kind of um, a proper kind of theater but it said that there was going to be some form of striptease. So obviously I thought that, that would be something I'd be interested in. And I wanted to go and see what it was about. And I was in this darkened auditorium and I just thought, I am not sure what that was about. What it did is it undermined all my assumptions. It pulled the rug in front of my feet. And from there on in, that was 2001, I still think about that performance. It felt like I was in an auditorium and she was looking me straight in the eye. Um, questioning my gaze, questioning my, my, my feminism. And from there on in, I have been looking at, at, at burlesque as a form. I don't think you can be simplistic as to what it is. There's a kind of multitude of forms that, are, that sit under the umbrella. On the whole, there includes striptease, but I think what sums it up is parody. It's about questioning people's assumptions in relation to questions of class, in relation to sexuality, in relation to gender. Um, it is questioning assumptions. Burlesque is this art form that anyone can do. It's dance, it's sharing your culture, your art, be it a message, part of your heritage, part of your religion. Like, it's sharing a message that you want to pass on to people, which is why it's an art form. It celebrates the body that you're in as you're in it. So it's not for whatever traditional beauty is or traditional female is or traditional body shapes. The body that you're in is perfect enough. You are enough. It can teach you power that you have with yourself, the power of your voice, the power that you can impact people. It's almost hypnotic the way that you can influence a class or an audience to change their perspective or educate them on something or be like, hey, this is my perspective on something. And because it's part of a show, their defences are down. I 
think burlesque is a celebration of everyone. And it's a celebration for other people, it's a celebration for ourselves. And finding who we are and who we want to be and getting to you know share this with the world and really passing on this gorgeous message of like, just be your best self, have a grand time. Burlesque also has this kind of like dimension where the moment you step on stage, you kind of have like an idea of who this person is. Um, might be you know, like this incredible femme fatale or um, any other character that might be stepping on stage. And, and this creativity of mixing, again, costuming and theatricals and adding on this like dancing, but also you know, like, kind of like making grander and, and getting these people to show themselves in all their aspects was one of the main drives that I had with burlesque. I do like a dress up. <laughs> I don't know, about 150,000 sequins or something. This is my portfolio. Um, I do a lot of sketching and stuff to um, go through. It's part of the process of if I'm designing costumes and stuff, it just helps me visualise stuff. So this is one of my first outfits that I did. This is my Elton John one that I did, so designed from head to toe, and someone in House of the Law, um, Afia Mia, or Mimi, our stage manager, she does stuff, so I sent her this brief, I'd made the headdress, which is the one up there. I have no knowledge of fabrics and stuff like that, so I do find that kind of having this visual language, I can show this to a designer and be like, this is sort of what I want, this is where I like something to fit on me. So this is a look that I did last year at Birmingham Pride for the Parade, which is based on Freddie Mercury and the goddess Athena. That was a fun look to do. Um, so that was from head to toe designing, which was really, really nice. But I tend to sketch through certain things. It just helps me understand the direction of a show, what I want the outfit to look like, um, what sort of character I want it to do. It's just, I think, with being a visual person myself, it does just help to kind of get a bit of an idea of what I'm going for, really. I just started uh, just trying to capture things when I, when I kind of had ideas. I was doing an ABBA night at one point, and I found these Disney princess dresses. You know, there's like dresses for three-year-olds. They were in a charity shop for pound. You know, ABBA, Disney. Disco, pink and blue, would like would be nice to find a cropped jacket and have flared sleeves like a fishtail in opposite pink and blue to legs. I don't even know what that means now, but you're not just wearing clothes on stage, you're wearing those clothes for a reason. They're telling a story, they're moving in a particular way, they're enhancing your body in a particular way, you're covering up in order to uncover. So I kind of really like that structural engineering in there. And, you know, I'm a bald man and there's a lot of lovely bald drag, but I love a wig and I love what it can do to your face. But then the wig has to stay on and then it has to be dressed in a particular way and it also has to say something. They change everything about, especially the transition that I would have is that I'm, you know, a, an old uh, man with no hair. And then suddenly she goes on and I've, all, and I've become Joan Collins, you know, there's things that you can do, you play with it, it makes it move, you swish, you swish back again, you know, there are ways that you can put it up and, you know, you fan the back of your neck, so it, it creates performative moves. I could be doing a hair commercial right now going, oh, dry hair, flaky scalp, just wash your hair in this. <laughs> when I was um, a mother, first time round, my world shrank. I had no money. I was perhaps zero hours, uh, I had threadbare slippers, I didn't go out, you know, and my world was, was well, pretty dull as well, you know, as a mother. But what I did is I had not I didn't have much money, but what money I had, I spent on three wigs. There was an electric green one, electric blue, and an electric pink. I saw these wigs and it was in a fancy dress shop and they were like, really expensive, you know, they're about 20 quid each, or maybe 24.95. And I thought, I'm gonna spend the money that I have on those wigs, right? And I went in and I got them and they're all in separate bags, beautiful uh, Marie Antoinette wigs. And I went home and I put these wigs on and I had this kind of multicolored um, dressing gown and gold slippers and I mowed the lawn 
in these wigs. I made the milk or heated up the milk for the baby in these wigs. And it made me feel like, um, you know, a million dollars. Suddenly I could feel extravagant, sort of sensual, um, and I could express myself through those wigs. The costume definitely does help, but it's... The costume can't really speak for itself only. It's kind of like the whole attitude and, and the way I carry myself, the way I have to, you know, like move around and, and imagine who I'm supposed to be right now. I'm not Natty anymore. I am this Viking warrior who is not here for battle, but also for, you know, like to carry on a ritual. And um, so there's something a lot more serious and a lot more kind of like ominous and, and, and somber that I'm carrying with me. And there's a lot of anger that I don't really let myself have the rest of the time that comes with it. Um, it's very freeing to be able to you not know, just like become this thing for a bit. Um, so, but it definitely takes a mind space. Um, I usually, yeah, I get a bit angry <laughs> when I get into costume. It enables, it's an enabler. Whether you're just putting some lipstick on and it suddenly makes you feel like, right, I'm in performance mode. It allows performers to take on a particular persona that either enhances their personality or allows them to be a completely different version of themselves. I've learned not to define it in one particular way, right? Because whenever I sort of make a decision about what costume does, its transformative role, I, I then talk to another performer and it's something completely different, right? So I don't, I don't want to be defining it as a, in a particular way, but it does do something. Right now, I need a bigger, a bigger mirror to just start. I feel gorgeous. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everybody, and good evening! <laughs> and welcome to A Lot of Old Vault, everybody. Our on posh show here at Prohibition Cabaret Bar in the heart of Newcastle, everybody. You are here. It's bloody warm in it. Oh, my goodness gracious me. And it is a pleasure to be here with you all. Thank you very much for coming out in your... Well, at capacity. We are at capacity, I'm sure you can see, and I'm sure you can feel with the sweat trickling down your crack. How I got into burlesque? Well, oh my goodness me. It all came down to one night out, and it was in a casino, you know, and I went to spend a penny, and on the back of the door was advertisement for burlesque lessons, and that was what happened. I just decided to go and spend a penny and ended up taking my kit off for the next 15 years. Now, I can't even believe I've actually brought this because I'm mortified. Are you ready for this? It's a shirt from Asda. <laughs> it's um, really, really um, wrinkly. And um, I don't think it still fits. Let's have a look. Oh, should we have a look? It's actually, that might be quite nice to put this on. No. <laughs> <laughs> I run House of Trixie Blue, which is, uh, well, by definition, an enterprise of burlesque entertainment. But this is um, a house that has different branches and different doors to it. So you open one door and we have lessons. We teach the art of the tea. And then open another door and then open up to um, hosting shows, like in this lovely venue here. Producing shows, um, stage management of shows. So. Ultimately, I've made burlesque my job because I've opened up so many different avenues within the whole entertainment arena and shoehorned burlesque into it and been like, right, okay, I love burlesque that much. I'm going to teach it, I'm going to put on shows, I'm going to host shows, I'm just going to do everything. There is one thing that we also don't do, and that is get our phones out, folks, and just leave your phone in your pocket, leave it there. We don't want anyone to take pictures of us. We don't want anyone to film this. <laughs> well, this is the feeling hot outerwear. And I don't even know why I've got this dress. It's from House of Fraser and it was a mate do. You can tell I've sewn it myself. I mean, that sewing is, that's absolutely shocking. That's it. You get a good bloody look at that. You know, absolutely mortifying. Oh, these were the first ever pasties of it. Oh, the first ever tassels. So it was actually feeling hot, so it was actual fire. Oh, look at this. It's a blinged up suspender belt with the same colors, beautiful rhinestone. I'm just so proud of just having the guts to have this as a costume. 
and that. <laughs> With a little bit of red duct tape <laughs> for me modesty. The glue we use, fabric fuse, loves it. This I'm going to, I'm trying to add the flowers in a certain way. Um, and all that goes with my nipple tassels. So everything blends in together from, from the outside to the inside to the underneath, you know? Yeah, it's all hand done. Everything's handmade. Um, I don't really buy anything as they are. Uh, buy the garment and decorate it myself and, and, and embellish it myself. It's a task and a half. These are for another act that I'm trying to uh, get together. <laughs> So we've got this one that goes on, just fits onto the head. So if everybody gets new whistles, I put them on the table. So I better look a right plonker with all this on my head, don't I? <laughs> Silk fans. So I used these at the weekend at the first direct arena. It's the uh, it was the Leeds Tattoo Expo. And that's where I did a family friendly performance. I don't think I've ever done a family friendly performance before but it worked. Favourite costume? Oh no. Uh, um, do you know what? Actually, I do have one. That is my favourite. So that's from my newest act. Um, and it's got a big robe that goes with it as well. Pink, blue and purple and all the stoning on it is um, those kind of colours, which is the bi flag. It's just a really euphoric act about bisexuality and just showing that kind of joy. Because again, that's not really represented. And all it is, is me dancing to Mariah Carey emotions and absolutely loving it. It was very expensive, but it's nice because it goes back to sort of my Latin dance roots and things like that. So it's kind of, I guess, my whole journey and what I want to say as an artist encompassed in one look. So that's probably my favorite. I sometimes think, what would I look good in? <laughs> <laughs> or what do I want to play around in? So I'll just talk about this for a second. It's a papier-mâché 1930s sort of Marcel wave. So it's kind of got this kind of cocktail-y thing going on. And I'm going to be singing songs for the Weimar Cabaret in a couple of weeks. And this is just perfectly Weimar, you know, this with something black and, you know, but it's, it's like a cartoon of it. So I often get an image of what I want to look like and then think, what are, the, what are the songs that are coming out of that? And then from that, I weave in an idea. Can I show you some of my shoe collection down in the cellar? Because there's also a whole bunch of shit that I'm holding on to. Mind your feet. It's quite low as well. Charity shop glasses, sunglasses galore, hats. A friend of mine was getting rid of her mum's stuff in the attic. I mean, you can't do better than that. This is my favourite. Of course, it's going to have to be a sort of Barbara Cartland moment. Now, I've no idea if I'm ever going to use this, but it's just enough to give me an idea of, you know, these nursing home blues. <laughs> you are just to follow up. Are you OK? So we're going to the Nightingale Club. Um, it's in the heart of the queer community in the gay quarter of Birmingham and the Nightingale has been running for over 50 years and it's been a real um, pioneer of Birmingham nightlife and um, particularly LGBT nightlife so really excited to be going there. It's really surreal when you spend that amount of time dreaming about something, figuring out logistics, talking about it, for it to actually be show day. It's gonna be a fantastic crowd. I'm, I, I've got a really good feeling. I think they're gonna be really fun. I hope they're really entertained. But if they're not, we'll just get our house locks to uh, whip them all into, sh <laughs> into shape and get them going. One of the first thing I, I tell people when I, I drag them to burlesque is don't be shy of really having a grand time and shouting and it's like it's it's a participation right and it's like the performer is going to give all, all of their um themselves on stage and you're going to like give this back to them right so um just like just shout and people don't expect it they just think no you don't clap at the end politely and be like yeah that was cool thank you um what we kind of like expected with other performances 
Um, so they're usually very surprised uh, with um, how interactive and, and big and, and fun and like how much you get yourself into it. And the love and the likes and the, the people that come up to you at the end of a show, and, oh, you're amazing. And they've paid to come and see me and they've come out of the way to congratulate me or give me an inspiration. And I wish I could do burlesque. And I said, do it. Do it. Oh, I wish I was slimmer. You don't need to be slim. It's totally opposite. You want some jiggle. Do you know what I mean? When you need to jiggle, you need meat on you. It needs to be celebrated curves. You know, we're women. You know, we've got nothing to be ashamed of or hide or feel conscious about, you know? I've seen people cry during brother shows and, and because, you know, like they get to see all the human beings that look like them or, you know, they have like a, such a wide variety of, of, of people. And, and these people are like just like embracing themselves, feeling themselves, representing characters. And with all different aspects, you don't have to like fit into one mold, whether it's for your physical appearance or like the way you like you behave. You have like extremely funny, but serious, but also like political. And you know, there's this whole mix of dimensions that I didn't get to really see before. Someone approached me after a show and um, you know, just started talking very first, like, oh, I've always loved Vikings and I've always wanted to see someone um, portray, you know, like a strong female character. They were very excited that um, I did not look like, kind of like, you know, like a generic character. It was more, you know, it looked like a, uh, she said, you look like a person, like someone that's just could be anyone, like, you know, like, could be me. And she's, like, got really excited because, you now she's like, I've never, I've always been excited for these type of content, but never felt like it could look like me, like I could embody this either. And, you know, we just started, you know, talking for, like, a good half an hour. And uh, we both ended up crying, um, you know, about, like, you no know, exchanges, this whole, like, um, journey, or, like, this whole, like, you know, like, experience around uh, not feeling like anyone looks like us anywhere, or not the way we would want to would be looking like. I have had people saying, should you be uh, telling this story or maybe using that voice? Why don't you do it through a different lens or do it? Um, and I don't think I've got any power as a man to tell a story of age through a male lens. Because I don't think I'm that impressive. I put Medusa on and I'm suddenly a clown and I've got the ability to break through uh, your judgment of whether I should say this or this person saying, well, that's not your story to tell. And then I can just say it and do the, well, here it is. As a producer, I might have someone do a very classic glamorous striptease, which it's to this kind of very Dieter-esque thing, but it's, um, someone with a bigger body size. That is what people expect the less to be, but that person who is bigger is taking up space on that stage. They're feeling delicious in their body, they're being provocative, they're being sensual, and we never ever get to see that in mainstream media and stuff. I think it's still on that boundary point about questioning what is legitimate for women to do or feminine presenting bodies to do and what's not. And it's a really exciting form for doing that. Where is that boundary point? And that's what burlesque does. It says, it questions where that boundary point, and, you know, and people's assumptions, right? It's saying, um, okay, so you're saying this is wrong, why? And that's what Ursula Martinez did to me when I was sitting in that auditorium, the darkened auditorium, and I thought she looked at me, which obviously didn't, and said, why are you thinking like that? Why, what should, you know, why do you think this is wrong or that I'm being objectified? I'm absolutely um, spectacular. We know it's a strip. We know the history of it sex work and stripping. And it's not really a lot of females, it's I think more the male side. Are you doing this and do you do that? And I'm always saying, no, educate yourself. Look at burlesque, it's 
1800s and it originates in, in Italy and there's a, there's a history of burlesque and it's, it's to make fun of and mockery. Yes, you take your top off, but you're not walking around and you're not swinging on a pole and getting guys to put 20 pound in your knickers throughout the night to feed yourself. I think it's the ignorance. There's an ignorance. Comments, remarks, sending genitalia in your inbox and thinking. And just recently, I was asked to show my vagina. And I said, oh no, I'm sorry, I don't do that. I'm a performer. Go on, go on. I said, no, 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 you've you're a stranger, but no, I don't do this. And then I was called a dirty nigger. This industry can be ugly sometimes. You will get pushed back. You will get heckled. You will get people saying, you know, as I've had on stage before, you know, I've had someone live in the audience go, oh, I don't want to see that on stage. Um, I don't want to watch that perform. I've had that. But at the end of the day, that's one person out of a room of God knows how many. So it doesn't matter. In my head, burlesque and the message that you have in your active stuff isn't gonna hit home with everyone. Everyone's gonna take away a different piece of your message when you do an act. But at the end of the day, if you're able to inspire one or more people with your message and they are able to get it, you've done your job. There's a lot of bravery required to put yourself on stage, having a voice and using that platform to remove your clothes and to say, here I am. And because I think of that bravery required, the flip side of that is this innate safety. Burlesque performers might judge each other in terms of like, I don't like that act, or I don't, I don't think that color looks that nice on you. And like, I don't know, what, isn't that skirt too long? You should make it short. So they might all be that. There isn't any judgment about you doing burlesque. It's become a kind of judgment-free zone in a way. You might like some people more than others. You might judge something to be not be as skilled as something else. But in terms of the actual, I choose to do burlesque, there's no judgment about that. So nobody sees me in a different way because I'm now a burlesque dancer. If they see me in a different way, they see me in a more positive light, they're amazed by that. And I think it attracts people who A, have that bravery, or B, want that bravery, because burlesque gives them the permission. There's a lot of permission giving in burlesque. Look, I'm gonna stand here, and then I'm gonna do this, and then I'm gonna do that. And the audience are gonna whoop and applaud for it. I think it attracts people because the audience are so forgiving. And I think that bravery and that safety is like the hand in hand thing, and people crave safety. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Bye. The weather remains. We've arrived. Oh. <laughs> oh, I don't know. The lights are on. One thing that's really important to me is backstage synergy because that can bring out the best in each other. And if you've got people that respect each other and get along, they all perform better. And that's really nice because you end up uplifting each other because you respect each other. <sighs> Them stairs are a lot. <laughs> Hello. Hi. You look gorgeous. Hello. <laughs> I love being able to watch other performers do their thing and do the most with their thing. And, and I feel inspired by it and I feel excited by it and I'm like it makes me like oh I wish I could do something like that or it inspires me to be better and that's what I love so it, it's definitely both I'm inspired by performers as people and by the performances that they do. My own experience I was lucky to be surrounded by a lot of people who had a drive to make it a safe space for everyone. Being in a space where you're free to talk about your own trauma why you want to do this or how you want to do it very freely and and sharing this with other people who might have similar experiences or their own things that they want to share openly some things you might not want to talk about in their daily life or even usually with like people you've just met um and having kind of like this recognition and bonding moment where you you feel like you're finally free to be yourself in this moment it attracts people who don't feel like they belong anywhere else right so they might think that that they, were, they, they don't fit in because they're too large, too thin, too tall, too tattooed, uh, too loud. Um, so I think 
that it appeals to people who feel like they don't fit in anywhere else and they can express themselves freely, their body, their sexuality. It's also about being able to be themselves within burlesque on stage or in the, in the audience, which they perhaps feel like they can't do elsewhere. My brother committed suicide 25 years ago. My brain couldn't accept that he was dead. So in my head, I thought he was working somewhere else. And that's how I coped with that loss. But then his anniversary was the November of the 25 years. And I think then it hit me, he's really, really gone. So in the February, I, um, I did this act, like I said, Melanie Monroe, Raise Your Glass. And uh, I had all my friends there and some of my brother's friends. We had a table at the front and we had his picture on there and candles and it, it was for him. And the whole of Barnsley East Dean Working Men's Club, I think they felt it. They got, got booth pumples. I think they got, they felt, they felt. They all got behind me on that act. And uh, I don't know how I got through it. You know, I was shaking, I felt sick, I felt sad. And Ellie said to me, dear, you all right? You're not yourself. And I said, yeah, I'm fine. I've just got something in my head, do you know what I mean? And I don't think she'd ever see me as quiet or concentrated, you know? When everybody raised the glass, it was just a moment for me, <laughs> do you know? And I think I, think I cried, actually, <laughs> when I came off stage. It was really emotional, it was really poignant, poignant, and it just, that was the one. That was the one. The very first thing I do is try to acclimatize my feet to being in heels. There are lots of physical challenges to performing as a Medusa. I'm in heels, I'm in fishnets, there's a wig, I'm wearing eyelashes. I'm sometimes not very good at putting my eyelashes on, so sometimes I'm half blind anyway. I wanna make sure that that is right. What I do is I prepare not to become someone else. I prepare to do the act. Okay, so I'm already having to think differently about how do I behave? It's going to make the angles different. So as a boy, you know, I might be like this, sort of try to parallel. As Medusa, I'm constantly playing with angles and the heels enable me to do that. But balancing on one heel whilst you're on the other toe requires more core than I've ever used before. So one of the things that I'll do is a kind of fish, swan thing. I have to, you know, I've got a few movements like that. And then, bang! As a person in this body, as Anthony, I'm often quite invisible and I'm quite happy to play backseat. I don't need to be important. When I'm walking through any room as Medusa, I'm going to be waving. I think I'm Princess Margaret. So it gives me permission to do that without feeling embarrassed or ashamed about it. I don't know that I become her, but I think I use elements of being this superannuated character. I mean, it's drag, but I'm a clown. I'm not a rosy rag wah, wah, kind of clown, but you, you might as well be, because it's there's a lot of using that facade to break into people's faces. And I'm, I'm much more sociable when I'm in, as Medusa. I'm happy to pose. I behave as if I'm the most beautiful thing in the room. So I think, if I step into anything, it's a set of beliefs which are not Anthony's. What I will do is I'll get closer to what it might feel like to be in the um, sort of stockings, corsety bit. And suddenly my legs feel freer and I'm like, oh, okay, I've really got to get, I've also got to get some moisturizer on my, on my knees. When I started burlesque, I was very self-conscious about a lot of stuff. And I feel it's been a long journey and there's no like still days where like it's hard on some aspects. And I think we all kind of like have this, this moment, you wake up and you're like, oh, today is not my day. Um, but um, overall it's really changed the perspective that I have of myself and the way I conduct myself on, on the daily. This courage and power that I feel from this character Sometimes I bring into my daily life where I'm like, <laughs> I have to do a big presentation to, I don't know, 100 people. I don't like public speaking, but I don't care because I pour blood on myself and I am a strong Viking queen who threatens people in the, in the dark room, right? You go through this journey of rediscovering yourself and it's not all like 
building up and everything's happy, right? There's a lot of moments where you just like doubt everything you do, challenging fear and um, just stepping out of my comfort zone and, and telling myself like, yeah, you, you can do it. You want to do this. Um, and you also want to do this for all the people who didn't want, I didn't feel like they could do it either. Cause I wish I had someone who looked like me doing this before. So yeah, I want to become this example, I guess. Yeah. Hmm? I did wonder how do you get your hair down? I have to glue it with pretty sticks, eh? What? When I founded House of the Law, I wanted to bring not only a different art form, but different body types that are in the queer community. I think allies are a huge part of queer life. I think women are. I think um, different genders, all of this content, and different body types as well. I think um, there is definitely within the sort of male or gay kind of community, there's definitely a hierarchy of body types as well. So I just saw that and I was like, what about everyone else? Burlesque isn't just about like sharing your art form and it's sharing your culture, but it's burying you, burying your soul. You're going up on this stage, literally stripping down as naked as you want to be, burying your most inner soul to a room full of strangers. Maybe at 60, I'm less attracted to shame. I don't need shame in my life. And you know, if there's a sense of shame, I go, whose shame is it? Mine or is it yours? It's very liberating. It's very empowering. It's made me braver. It's expanded my creative skills. It's forced me to learn new things. And it's exposed me to a community of people that I would never had access to. Valesk is real. You've got fat spilling out of corsets. You've got people pulling ugly faces when they're doing stuff. You've got different body types, different people expressing that. And it's just raw. When you are watching them, you are watching a living art form live and you're just seeing that for what it is. And I think that that is just magical. Hey!